Hard work being a horrible goose. <laughs> but after a hard day's work, there's nothing quite like unwinding with my Nintendo Switch TM. And as luck would have it, there's now a game about being a horrible goose that I can play at home to save my energy. That's a good thing too. I was getting tired of poking old men in their junk with my mouth. Untitled Goose Game may be the best game I've ever played. And it hasn't even got a name. Okay, that's an exaggeration. I think I prefer Cars 2. But objectively, it's certainly the <clears throat> Citizen Kane of video games. It doesn't matter how I feel about it. There's factually nothing wrong with it. Something doesn't add up, though. What month is it? When the cryptos creak and the tombstones quake. It's close to love for swinging way. Yeah, so how does any of this fit in with the month of terror? <laughs> Well, if you're asking that question, you clearly haven't had a run-in with a goose before and consider yourself lucky. They're horrifying. <coughs> They've got beady black voids for eyes, they can fly, they have teeth, and they hiss when they're angry, which is basically all the time. Since all you need to do is look at them and the gloves are off. <coughs> Feeding bread to some ducks, they'll challenge you for the whole loaf. Walking alongside them, they'll take that as a threat. Flying in a plane, they'll throw themselves into the engines and take it down. These geese aren't Canadian. They're not nice! But all of that changes when you boot up Untitled Goose Game, because this time, you get to ruin everyone else's day. <laughs> Untitled Goose Game is the most advanced and intensive game on the Switch so far, testing the limits and capabilities of the console unlike any other game before it. And that's interesting because it's nothing more than a thinking game. I wouldn't necessarily call it a straight puzzler because it relies on a lot of stealth, positioning and timing as much as figuring out how to cross off things from your to-do list. But it's definitely not a platformer or action game either. I mean, unless you want to do this in an action game. This isn't Goat Simulator where screwy physics and doing the most insane nonsense is the name of the game. No, you are just a goose waddling around an English village trying to upset everyone, which already makes it the most realistic game ever made. You just need to be a mug, that's all, and annoy everyone in the most creative and imaginative ways possible in order to get them so mad that they accidentally open a passage to the next area so you can get into a model village and steal a bell in order to add it to your collection of the same bell the village keeps on replacing. You need to get a bell to the end. So you're a bell. It's also impossible to play the game without laughing like a maniacal British supervillain. <laughs> when I first started, I ran over to a bench, picked up a sandwich, and dunked it in a lake. And right there, I realised... This is only the beginning. How you solve all of these puzzles is mostly up to you, depending on what you can pick up, drag along, hide behind, flap at, or honk at. <laughs> Which is what makes solving these puzzles so fun. They aren't just creative and often challenging without any hand-holding solutions, but the geese controls are simple and the visuals childishly endearing. It reminds me a lot of Katamari games, actually. <laughs> Leading to total E for everyone carnage as you try and get inside these citizens' heads and think logically about how you can make them do the things you need them to do with the limited moves available. <laughs> You have to directly influence their behaviour based on their individual expressive personalities to your gain, and I find that ingenious. All without voice acting or guideposts, by the way. You'll be making a gardener hammer his thumb. <laughs> breaking a woman's broom. <laughs> scaring an old man into spilling tea on himself. <laughs> locking a young boy inside a phone box. <laughs> washing a woman's undies in a water feature. <laughs> Taking a stall away from an old man so he falls over. Stealing a young boy's toy and sticking it in a shop so he has to buy his own toy back. You're completely terrible, but oh. adorable. And the calming ambient piano pieces that suddenly get more disjointed and manic the more things you steal give the alert themes in Metal Gear Solid a run for their money. Hey, look at me! I'm Liquid Goose! Wait a second. If I'm in a model village of the same village I've been playing in, and there's a model village version of the model village in that village, I mean there's a model village within the model village of the model village. 
I've also seen a lot of people complain about the controls in this game and how the goose tends to get stuck on everything, especially while you're running, and I think I'm just going to help those people that think that. Not only should you not be holding the run button down all the time because this is primarily a stealth puzzle game and you'll attract everybody's attention all around you, but you can move 360 degrees around you perfectly if you're not sprinting, so you have to alternate between the two. Sprinting is great for wide open spaces and last minute dashes if you've stolen something, but if you're in a tightly packed area with lots of hiding places, yeah, don't hold the sprint button down. You just have to take it a bit slower and you'll see that you'll maneuver around the tight spaces a lot easier. Overall, Untitled Goose Game may be short and too simplistic in visuals or gameplay for some, but you don't really play it for that. You play it for all the other elements it has combining together to create one of the most innocent and charming games I think I've ever played. If you like the concept and like what you see in this video, chances are you're gonna fall in love with the game automatically, just as much as I did. I mean, look, even the pause menu is a load of English road signs. You won me over with that alone, game developers. Although I do wish it was that easy to quit from a motorway, and I don't remember ever seeing an options petrol station. Although I do really want to go to Resume Park. I hear it's lovely this time of year. It was my destiny to be here. In the box. <laughs> even if you get a little frustrated trying to work out some of the more cryptic aspects of the game, it doesn't matter. Because if you like what you see, then you are going to enjoy it no matter what. While working out all of the puzzles and witnessing the total misery I was causing to this quaint little town for a stupid, selfish reason, I had a smile on my face from start to end. And sometimes a game just needs to do that, even if a few puzzles require a bit too much waiting for the characters to cycle through their actions. Honk honk bitch, I'm coming for your ankles! To be honest though, my arms are really tired from all the flapping I was doing at the vicar yesterday, so how about we play another game, but on a lighter console? Is that a banana in my pocket? Or am I hungry for banana? This here is the Nintendo Switch Lite and the main reason this video exists, so thank you so much to Nintendo for sending me one for a review. Looks like you skipped Halloween and jumped straight into Christmas. Yes, I also wanted an excuse to talk about Goose Game and show you that geese have teeth on their tongues, you're welcome. But as the title of this video suggests, after getting this in the post, I decided to literally push this thing to breaking point. I played it, I sat on it, I baked it, I ate it, I put it in my- And I did the same for my old Switch too. Also, I could compare the two and advise you all on if you should get a Switch Lite next to your old Switch, or if you should get one of these in the first place if the original Switch didn't sell you. And you know what? Out of everyone I know that has the Switch Lite so far, Nobody got it in yellow. Why not? It's question block yellow. It's Mario Sunshine yellow. Where's the love for yellow? I even did a scientific survey on my Twitter to find out what the most popular colours were from the people who bought the thing already. And barely anybody got yellow. You're all cowards. Why didn't you get yellow? I can't see a single reason why you wouldn't want to get yellow. Who lives in a pineapple? Part 1. What does it do? The Nintendo Switch Lite is more or less exactly what it says it is, a lighter and smaller edition of the regular Switch. And because of that, it does more or less exactly the same things the regular Switch does. Same user interface, same online store, same download speeds, at least from what I tested, same cartridge slot, same memory card slot, same touch screen, same gyro motion controls, same button layout, same charging cable input, and same headphone jack. But the caveat is that the Switch Lite comes to you at a heavy discount compared to the regular Switch. In the UK, for example, it's 80 to 100 pounds cheaper, or like 90 to 120 dollars cheaper in the US. Which means that you must sacrifice something else other than the size in order to save the money. So you lose the Switch aspect of the Switch. Yes, the gimmick of the original console relevant to its namesake was that you could play a game portably on it, then slide it whenever you wanted to into a dock connected to a TV and switch the game onto an external display. But the Switch Lite doesn't have that. Nintendo dear! This is a portable exclusive edition of the main console. It's a Nintendo... So automatically, if you don't have a Switch, but really want a Switch and didn't get the original one because it was a bit too pricey and you were just going to play it in portable mode anyway, then this thing is the bargain of the century. I mean, I think that sacrificing TV compatibility for the sake of saving a hundred big ones is a no-brainer. Whether or not you think this is worth it if you already own a regular Switch, though, is another story. So as we go on with this anally sis, I hope you can draw your own conclusions on that. It is important to mention, though, that if you do plan on getting the light as a companion piece to your original Switch, Nintendo does support automatic cloud saving nowadays if you sign into 
your Nintendo account on both devices, but it isn't seamless like with Steam. And one thing that is a little annoying is having the foresight to remember to manually download your save data from the cloud on the next system you play the same game on every time you plan to continue that game on another system. It's nice that it's there, but automatic updating on save downloads would have been really appreciated, especially if it already auto-uploads once you save a game anyway. Another thing to note is that unlike the regular Switch, each half of the Joy-Cons don't disconnect from the system. They're permanently cemented onto the sides of the console and it doesn't feel right. I just want to, I just want to snap it. As a plus, this means you'll never lose the Joy-Cons or have to worry about their individual battery life. But the cost is that if something goes wrong with the controls, including the infamous Joy-Con drift, the fast and the furious. then fixing or replacing that end of the malfunction just got a whole lot harder for you. Thankfully, you can still connect every variation of controller to the thing, including the Pro Controller, third-party controllers, and even two halves of other Joy-Cons. So I guess that's always an option. But where this is a really nice feature and does allow you to play local multiplayer and play games that require individual Joy-Con motion controls like Super Mario Party, which would be otherwise impossible on the Switch Lite on its own, for some unholy reason, Nintendo decided to remove the stand from the regular Switch, completely negating the fact that it's local multiplayer compatible and yet doesn't project an image onto a bigger screen. So playing on flat tables with friends on the light just got a little more irritating all because you can't God damn it! Part 2. How it feels when you tell it it's adopted. Using the Switch Lite as a portable system, in my opinion, totally shits all over its dad and then tells its mum to leave him because he's covered in shit. Yes, that's his wife, he's into older women. It actually fits in most of my pockets, no sweat, which was a good start, but then I was more shocked to find out how comfortable the light was to handle in this portable state. Not just because of the weight, I mean, it is 100 grams lighter, so dropping it on your face while in bed is actually kind of comfortable. I love it. But because the buttons on this thing are absolutely lovely. Wait a second, what is that? on my scale. Yes, I do massively miss the HD Rumble Joy-Con controls on the original Switch, meaning that there's no vibration at all on the Switch Lite on its own. But I'm willing to give that a miss in exchange for DualShock 4 styled soft press buttons that have that satisfying clunk with every press on the D-pad and the face buttons. You know, it doesn't feel like the spongy and stiff GBA D-pad buttons and certainly does not feel like the rigid and snappy standard Joy-Con buttons, which I don't really have a problem with on the face buttons, but on the D-pad? No. Awful. Puke. Every time you press these buttons, a kitten gets stomped on. The only buttons that feel identical to before are the analog sticks, if you class them as buttons, the home button, the plus and minus buttons, the snapshot button, and the L and R buttons. Yes, even the ZL and ZR triggers feel completely different. They aren't springy and light like on other controllers, but instead of having the snappy and stiff <coughs> buttons, you get this lovely cushioned click that feels way more like a trigger than the original Joy-Cons do. By the way, I am aware that the standard Switch button layout is because if you want to split the Joy-Cons in half and give one to another player, you want to have very similar button feelings and similar button styles on each half, so I do understand why there's those snippy snappy horrible buttons on the standard Switch, but if you're going to be playing exclusively in portable mode, this thing feels ten times better. Oh, and also, we already know the light is indeed lighter, but what about thickness? Any change there? Well, surprisingly, no. They're practically identical. But who cares? I mean, this is the Nintendo Switch Lite, not the Nintendo Switch Malnourished. Not to mention, it feels more stable with it being its own system too. Not that the original Switch didn't feel stable out of the dock, but there is a tiny bit of wobble that doesn't exist on the Lite. And in my blue Joy-Cons case, you can't nearly drop the entire thing while playing it due to a faulty locking system. Compared to the original Switch as well, the Lite gets nowhere near as hot after long play sessions, which is great because the most comfortable way to hold the device is to have all of your fingers on the back of it supporting it and that is where the most heat is generated, so can't complain there. And speaking of the system getting hot... Part 3. How vroom vroom does it go, Daddy? I want one! Okay, it's pretty obvious at this point that I have been using the Zelda Link's Awakening remake as my example game for everything technical I've been testing so far, just to be fair on both consoles. And you know what? What the hell? I already talked about Untitled Goose Game for God's sake, so while I'm at it, why don't I just give you my quick thoughts on this remake? Link's Awakening on Switch is a total joy and now one of my favourite Zelda games. It may be a little bit more linear and one by one with dungeon progression than other Zeldas in this style, and I think I prefer Link Between Worlds, honestly, but I don't care because the world is enthralling and filled to the brim with secrets, the characters are memorable and wacky, it has a surprising amount of emotion for such a simple story, you can build and share your own dungeons, even if you can only locally share them with amiibos, the art style is unique and adorable, the dungeon upgrades you grab are either 
just plain fun to use or allow Link to traverse the world in ways unheard of in other Zelda games, and even things as simple as using your shield as an actual item to add a little bit more timing and thought behind combat makes the experience that much more engaging than just standing there and letting attacks bounce off of your shield when you're not attacking. You need to protect yourself by holding the button at the right moment, and you can't really keep it held down forever because your movement speed is cut dramatically while you do so. By the way, I never played the original Game Boy game, but I do know how often you needed to pause and switch out items to fit them on the only two action buttons that system had, even with the sword and the shield. So I'm immensely glad that they not only used more buttons for items, but also made dungeon items that should have been permanent upgrades to Link in the original actually be permanent upgrades, like lifting heavy boulders or dashing really fast. I cannot imagine how tiring the original must have been for switching every usable item every five seconds. Oh, and you've got to love being able to put different types of pin all over the map so you can remember which single rock needs to be pushed aside five hours later so you can fall down a bloody hole. So yeah, you should get this game. It's fantastic, if a little expensive, considering you can get six totally remade retro games for only a tiny bit more money. I don't see why this was worth the same as Breath of the Wild in the slightest. Nintendo, fix that now, please. Also, watch out for the performance of it. Yeah, I'm sorry, guys. For everyone talking about how perfect of a remake this is, even though the game runs at 60 FPS most of the time, whenever you load into a new area, you get ridiculous slowdown. And some areas like the Rapids never seem to run smoothly at all, no matter how long you stay in the area. But luckily, this ties in beautifully with my test on the performance of both systems. I already mentioned that the Switch Lite in portable mode gives off a lot less heat than the original Switch, and surprisingly, the fans on the top of the console are barely noticeable on the light when I could hear them a few times on the original. I guess this must mean they've smoothed out the same processes or something to make them run more efficiently, because it's certainly not a massive power upgrade. Both systems, as far as I could see, ran Link's Awakening with more or less identical performance with the frame drops occurring in equal amounts but just at different points. But here's the big difference, the load times, whether booting up save data, waiting for the game to start or moving from one area to the next were seconds faster on the light than the regular Switch, so consider me massively impressed. And hey, the light may also run some games a little bit smoother, but for the sake of equality, it didn't run Link's Awakening any faster, but it did load faster by a long way. Thank you to Nintendo once again for letting me have a review copy of Link's Awakening for my Switch Lite when I already bought the thing on my regular Switch, just so I could film them both being played at the same time. Part 4. How good does it look? because I'm really shallow. I'm not talking about comparing the screen of the light to the TV version of the regular Switch, because that's just not fair. I'm talking about the screens of each system itself at full brightness and how they both look. And to be honest, if there are any major differences to colour, anti-aliasing, sharpness, clarity, I honestly couldn't tell. They're both practically identical, save for the screen size. The only major difference I noticed was that on the Switch Lite, the darker areas of the screen looked a little bit more deep and rich in the colours and a little bit more contrasted. But to be honest, that's more noticeable looking at it through this camera lens and with this lighting setup I have. In real life, you can barely notice anything. And the differences are so minuscule, I don't think this was worth its own part of the video. So if you don't mind, I think I'm going to get my pistol from the attic, point it at my head and pull the effing trigger. Part 5. How good do I sound? Sorry, I mean, how good does it- Unlike the displays of each system, the speakers on both of them do provide major differences while in portable mode. For comparison's sake, I recorded both systems with the same mic from the same distance of each system with them both on max volume, and just take a listen yourself. <laughs> it is noticeable. The regular Switch is not only a little bit louder, but I think crisper and clearer with its audio frequencies. I don't know if they tried to beef up the bass a little too much on the light, or if it's just the quality of the speakers, but it does sound just a tiny more tinny and muffled with certain lower end frequencies. It's clear, don't get me wrong, and voice samples and sound effects sound fantastic, but it is different. To be fair, I usually wear headphones while in portable mode anyway, so this doesn't bother me personally, but with the sound quality, the point goes to the original. Part 6. Death! How long does each system stay alive? Well, it took me far too long to figure out these timings, but before I go into them, please note that in order to see how the percentages were changing between each device, I had to turn the systems on and off briefly for each of them, which may have affected things a little bit, so consider these estimates. Oh, and once again, I did test all of these things while playing Link's Awakening in the background, because unless you were in the middle of a game and needed to carry it on later, 
why would you need to stick the thing in sleep mode in the first place? Anyway, this is the data I collected with all of these factors at play. While playing Link's Awakening on both systems, I managed to get three to four hours of gameplay on the regular Switch from full charge, which was nearly doubled by the light at a whooping five to six hours, which makes me very happy for sessions of games that eat up the battery life like CTR or Breath of the Wild. While in sleep mode, I then decided to count down how long it took each system to drop by 1% of battery from full charge. The regular Switch took about five hours to drop 1% and the light took about six hours, so you can obviously see why waiting for them to entirely die on me from 100% wasn't going to happen. And as far as I'm aware, the sleep mode drains more battery the lower the battery level is, but I'm really not sure about that, so consider this a wide berth. But hey, at least we know that they can still both sleep for years without needing a charge. Finally, I then tested out how quickly the battery charged from 1% to full using the same AC adapter that came with the Switch Lite. The regular Switch took about 4 hours and 5 minutes to charge to full, while the Lite took 2 hours and 50 minutes. God Damn it's thirsty. <laughs> Part 7. Nothing. Go away. And that's all I've got to say, everyone. So I hope this video was informative enough for you. If you were thinking about jumping on the Switch bandwagon for the first time, if you were thinking about getting an upcoming Christmas gift, or if you wanted to get a companion piece next to your original Switch. But if you wanted to do that, you'd have to be a little Nintendo rich. At this point, I only have one question. Where is... My goose... in Smash? Whoa, everybody, you decided to stay until the end of this video? Very kind of you. Yeah, the outtakes will be on in just a second, so please stay tuned for that. But first of all, I just wanted to say again, thank you for watching this whole video. Like, it's two reviews and a, a versus comparison console war thing in one video, something I haven't done before. Hopefully it was informative and entertaining enough for you, or stupid. I'm, I'm happy if you found it stupid. Thank you to every single person on the screen right now that have supported this channel via Patreon. Wouldn't be able to do this without you guys. My Patreon will be in the description below. You'll get loads of benefits if you choose to support the channel month by month. And you'll also find my Facebook and Instagram down there, which is... Uh, they're the two social networks I am on constantly. I'm on them all the time, always updating, always taking pictures of stupid shit. My Instagram is full of bad car parking as well, um, because it's surprising how much that happens in the UK especially. So go and follow those two if you want to go and um, see what I'm up to day to day. Get updates on videos and stuff like that and see how many late nights I stay up until about 7am getting this stuff done. So yeah, thank you. But also, before the outtakes come on, special, special thank you to the top tier supporters for this month. Basil, Mitchell Reed, AD Thornton Smith, Iwucha, Nightshade96, ND the Dude, Exopaz, Matthew Hubble, Scooper Boop, Daniel LaRosa, GTFO Brikachu, Matthew O'Donnell, TARDIS Type 40, Caleb Sanders, Red Eyed Critic, Doom Guy, Luke Jones, Brandon Butler Williams, J Man Crew, The Game Shed, Maiden of Ravens, Anders Amdal, and Alex Van Kirk. Thank you so much, every single one of you amazing people. This is Goose Sound Recording. And the kazoo, the paint's coming off in my mouth. Oh, baloney! It is so hard being a horrid Henry. So I hope this video was informative enough for you if you were thinking about getting on the Swinch... Swinch? <laughs> the Nintendo Swinch? <laughs> is it a Switch that has a winch in it? <laughs> Dan! <laughs> Where's he going? He's to your left. He's sniffing the wagon. <laughs> okay. Uh... My jeans want to play Link's Awakening. <laughs> <laughs> is that mould in here? <laughs> is it? What is this? <laughs> oh, it's all fuzzy. No, it's all fuzzy. No. And you know what? What? The oh, hello, Stan. <laughs> you okay, my lord? He's going to go and eat now. Are you oh, done? No. no? No, he has to move. He has to move because <laughs> sleeping on the nice comfy sofa that we allow him, we bestow the sofa on him, but no, he wants to sleep at the bottom of the stairs. Shut up, Chloe. Stop coughing. <laughs> Sorry. Get better. Sorry. You're interrupting our filming. No, no. I'm sorry. You're not sorry.